holy name. I love to praise his holy name. Is God good today? You ought to say hallelujah. Good God Almighty. I love to praise his name. Let me take a moment now. <laughs> Amen. Good morning. <laughs> And I want to say for the record, happy resurrection morning. Amen. 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 We're here today to celebrate our salvation, to celebrate the goodness and grace of God, and as was alluded to a moment ago, to celebrate what's traditionally called Easter Sunday. But as we celebrate today, I think it's important for us to understand that God has a glorious plan for every one of you today. I want everyone under the sound of my voice to know that you are significant and important to God. It does not matter what everyone else may say. There may be those who may belittle you. There may be those who will try to devalue you as a person, who will say that you're really not worth uh, as one of my friends would say, two dead flies with their wings cut off. <laughs> but to God, you are somebody. Amen. And because you are somebody, you won't let anybody tell you that you're nobody. Because everybody is somebody in the kingdom of God. You are so valuable. You are so valuable in the sight of God. That God gave his very best. He bankrupted the portals of heaven to ensure that you may have a right to the tree of life. So when we sing those songs of praise, it's a welling up within as we understand the goodness of God, the mercy of God, and our heart begins to bubble up uh, in gratitude to God for all that he has done, and somebody lost their diamond ring. Find us keepers. Lose as we put <laughs> We're going to put this right here for whoever uh, wants to claim it. You have to describe it. <laughs> I see a sister waving her hand. We got it for you, sister. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. Uh, today I want to talk about, uh, I want to talk from the question. And the question is, did Jesus die in vain? Did Jesus, was his dying for naught? And I believe we who are members of the body of Christ understand that to be a rhetorical question. A question that the answer is inherent in the question itself. Did Jesus die in vain? You see, we are here. Standing before God, redeemed, sanctified, and set apart because of the redemptive work of Christ on the cross. The death and resurrection of Jesus brings to a climax the theme of the grace of God. The grace of God is, is revealed to us and is made uh, vividly clear to us through the death, the burial of Jesus Christ. Understanding that Jesus died. For our sins. He died that we might live. He is the one that we read about in uh, Isaiah, the 53rd chapter, the suffering servant, uh, uh, the one who has bore our sins, the one who took upon himself uh, the marks or the, uh, the affliction and the wrath of God in our behalf. He was the one who was slain before the foundation of the world. The Bible says, who have believed our report? And who have the law on of the Lord been revealed? Speaking of Jesus, he grew up like the tender shoot. Uh, and we understand historically he came out of the, the, from the root of, of, of Jesse. Yes. Understand this, that all of the uh, prophetic information we have from the Old Testament point to this glorious climax where Jesus bore our sins. And that's what we're here today. 
we're here to celebrate. You see, the fact that there is a church is born out of the fact uh, that Jesus died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried uh, for three days in the heart of the earth, according to the scriptures. But that means nothing. That means absolutely nothing if he did not raise from the dead. I'm glad that the tomb is still empty today. I'm glad that the clothes, those grave clothes, are still over there laying by themselves. I'm glad that there's no body in that grave. See, he rose from the dead. See, the death and resurrection of Jesus, it not only does it bring uh, to a climax the whole idea of the grace of God, it also shows the sovereign will of God to give a free gift. He gave us something that we did not deserve. We could not earn, and but he gave it to us, not because we were so deserving of it, not because you were so good, Amen. because you needed it. Amen. You needed God's grace in your life. And so we talk about uh, we contributed nothing to our salvation experience in the mind of God. There is nothing that we could do to earn a right position um, in the sight of God. That's why we sing the song, Amazing Grace. You don't have to understand it, all of the nuances of it. We are amazed by the goodness of God. Because every one of us, as you look at yourself, you know that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And we also know that the Bible says that the wages... Uh, the, 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 the earnings of sin is nothing no more than death, which means separation, separation from God. But even in the, in the midst of the understanding and the fact that we have sinned and fallen short, we now are able to understand and appreciate more perfectly the grace of God. Amen. Oh, amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I help me out, brother. Was lost. Oh yes, I was. But now. Land, but now, now I see. And that being the case, and that being the case, grace is amazing. We understand that Jesus died for every one of us, according to the scriptures. For your least sin, sent Jesus to the cross. It was the grace of God. It was the love of God, the mercy of God that was shared on us through this marvelous and sacrificial act of Jesus. I'm amazed by that. Don't ask me to explain it. I can sprout some words. We can have some kind of theological argument and conversation. But at the end of the day, it's God's business. It's God's business. His sovereign and free will, his grace, reaches even me. And it can reach you today if you accept it by faith. But not only, not only do we see the death of Jesus, the vicarious, the substitutionary death of Jesus, but the Bible says that he was buried in the heart of the earth. And the significance of this burial not only does it fulfill the prophetic message of Jonah, uh, but it also helps us to understand uh, the, the full import of what death means. The word death is the word thanatos. That word simply means separation from all that which animates you. Everything that gives you the breath of life has been taken away. And we understand that death came as a result of sin. We don't have time to go back in the book of Genesis to find out and to discover how death was ushered in through man's rebellion and disobedience in the garden. 
But we do understand that they were cast out. Adam and Eve were cast out. They were separated from the tree of life. And even as we go through the part of the time and we look, we see that death has always been Satan's trump card over lost humanity. We've always had a fear and a phobia of the mysteriousness of death. And it was, it was Job who asked the question, if a man dies here, he live again. And we, for centuries, uh, were debating and asking that question. And Jesus, or God, gave us glimpses. He gave us glimpses of this idea of resurrection. Uh, we understand that Lazarus, he died. But you see, after a few days, months, or however you want to count it, he died again. Notice what the Bible says uh, in the 15th chapter of the book of 1 Corinthians as we begin to move into our lesson today. Uh, we understand uh, that the resurrection is through the resurrection that we uh, indeed undergo life transformation. Transformation. Being changed into the image of Christ comes as a result of the glorious resurrection. You see, as you go through situations and circumstances in your life, what is it that allows you to maintain Christian integrity? What is it that allows you to, to, to hold on to God's unchanging hand, to, to, do, to do right when everyone uh, around you is doing wrong? When the spirit of compromise... Uh, encounters you in your walk, and you have an option to go to the left or to the right. What is it that makes you take the higher road? What is it that gives you uh, the capacity to keep on living for God, even though it seems more popular or more convenient or more even advantageous for you to take the low road? What is it that allows you to stand up for Jesus, even when you know that your stance can result in persecution and even death? What is it? What is it that gives you the impetus or the fuel to keep on keeping on? When it's easier, it's easier to turn back and retreat. It's easier to, to compromise and give out, give up, and give in. What is it? I offer to you today the resurrection. It's the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because with the resurrection of Jesus, now we have hope of our own resurrection. We, in our mortal and finite uh, bodies, we, we, we yearn for uh, immortality. Let me say this today. Even one's ability to live the Christian lifestyle is wrapped up in and predicated upon the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So when we ask the question, uh, did Christ die in vain? I want to talk about the implications. The implications of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see, the purpose in this message is that, that our resurrection hope in Christ empowers us to overcome the obstacles of this present life as we await the glory of the next life. You see, you can't get to the next life without going through this present life. And the way in which you go through this present life, the way in which you uh, deal with the ordeals of life, the pressures, the vicissitudes, and, and all of those, the, the ebb and flow of life, the way in which you deal with that, not only is it, will it determine your final outcome, but also it gives you, when you look at the end game, when you look at the finality of the glory that will be experienced, that even gives us uh, the, 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 the wherewithal to walk and to say yes to Jesus when everyone else is saying no. Amen. My objective is that we live a resurrected life. Amen. That we live a life based on resurrection power. Live a life uh, that says, I am now able to walk in the newness 
the newness of life. It's a different quality of life. It's a different experience uh, when you have resurrection life in front of you. When you understand that you're living by the power. The power, the Bible says, uh, what's that passage in Galatians 2 and 20? I am crucified with Christ. I am crucified. I am put to death. I am crucified with Christ. Uh, In other words, I have fellowship in his death. And when you have fellowship in his death, you now uh, enjoy the benefits of his death. Understand that the Bible says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Watch this. Yet not I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. Now the faith, now the life, that I now live in the flesh. Now watch this. I live by what? The faith. Watch this. It doesn't say the faith in, but the faith of. (laughs) Not simply I just believe in Jesus, but the faith of the Son of God. The same resurrected faith uh, that he had, the same trust and and, and faith in God's ability to raise him up, the same faith that Jesus had when he entrusted and committed himself to God, the Christian, the believer, was walk in the faith of the Son of God who loved me and he gave himself for me. What kind of faith are you operating under today? Are you merely having faith in him? I believe that that is Jesus. Uh, uh, but you're walking by the faith and the power of Jesus. The same power that is a regenerating power. It's the same power that now allows you to walk in the newness of life. Amen. To experience. To experience the very relationship with God that empowers you. That transforms you. That makes you a witness for him. That's what this thing is all about. <laughs> the implications of the resurrection. Notice, notice what the text says. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if you keep in memory what I have preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. Now, he says in verse 3, I deliver unto you, first of all, some versions say of first importance. I deliver unto you, first of all, which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins. Notice it didn't say how Christ died. But he died for a purpose. His, 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 his death was not in vain. He died for a purpose. And that purpose was for the washing away, for the cleansing of our sins. More specifically, to be what's called a propitiation for God. To be that satisfactory sacrifice. In other words, when God sees all of our sins, it triggers the wrath of God. And because the wages of sin is death, we all deserve death. And therefore, there needs to be a punishment exacted on the sinner. And Jesus steps in and says, I'll take their place. I said, I said grace is amazing. He stepped in and he said, I'll take their place. And therefore, he died for our sins. It's because we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God that Jesus, he died. And it goes on to say, notice, uh, it was according to the scripture. And that he was buried and that he rose again the third day. Now, the King James does not do that justice. See, this idea of the King James says, and he rose again the third day. There have been other individuals in the Bible who rose from the dead. But then they died again. <laughs> right? Amen. But you see, the construction of this text really says that uh, he has been raised. Instead of simply he rose, 
He has been raised. Not simply he rose and, you know, to rise and fall. He has been raised. It moves us to understand the permanency of this resurrection. For he lives to die no more. He is a forever living Savior. He uh, has been raised from the dead. All of this, my friends, uh, was according to the scripture. Now let me just say this. Uh, Our faith is based on the fact that Jesus, number one, is God. And John In John, the first chapter, the Bible says, in the beginning was the Word. A better construction of that text, uh, before there was a beginning, the Word had been. The eternality of the Word. And the Word was uh, with God. That word with is the word pros, which means face-to-face relationship, intimacy, one. They were one with one another. One. In purpose, one in call, one in essence. That's why when Jesus said he referred to, to, to God as his father, they wanted to kill him. Because <laughs> they knew that by making that statement, the word for son is the word, uh, in this text, the word huios. Uh, that means he was the same in essence. His very essential nature. He was deity. He was divine. That's why they said, we got to stone this guy. He's he's speaking blasphemy. He's making himself equal with God. But you understand this. He says, but the word, in verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. No one has seen the Father, but the only begotten Son has declared him. That's the word from which we get the word exegesis. He has revealed, he has made him known. Jesus is the exegesis, the full explanation of God. If you want to see, if you want to know who God is and how he acts, just look at Jesus. Because Jesus, uh, the word, Jesus is the word uh, incarnate. Now the challenge is, when when Jesus left this earth, and then he said, you're going to undergo a transformation. Acts chapter 1 and verse number, what is it, 8 and following, when they begin to ask, you know, when, when, what's going to be the sign of your coming and all that kind of stuff? And when are you going to restore Jerusalem to its splendor and all that kind of stuff? Jesus cut to the chase. He said, you know what? In Gino's translation, ain't none of your business. <laughs> is that right? It yeah, ain't none of your business. He said, but you shall receive power. Once the Holy Ghost, when the Holy Ghost has come upon you, you shall receive power, and then you shall be my witnesses. If, 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 if Jesus is the incarnation of God, then the church has to be the incarnation of Christ. If you want to know what Jesus thinks and how Jesus would act, you ought to be able to look at the church. Amen. And we ought to be able to show the face of God. We ought to be able to uphold the character of Christ in our living And so therefore, notice, the resurrection confirms, number one, the deity of Christ. Yes, it does. Notice what the Bible says over in Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1 and verse number 14 says that he was what? Uh, He was declared to be the Son of God with power. How? By the resurrection of the dead. It was the resurrection of the dead that was the crowning proof of the deity of Christ. It was the resurrection uh, of Jesus Christ that, that, that gives hope to us. Notice uh, the resurrection of Christ fulfills the messianic prophecies about Christ, but also it describes a person as well as the purpose of Jesus. For the Bible says that God so loved the world. Oh, yes, he did. That he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus, Jesus came that we may have everlasting life, that we may have eternal life. And that simply means a, a, an everlasting and eternal 
relationship with the Father. The very relationship that was severed because of sin and rebellion against God. Now the hostility or the enmity is taken away through Jesus' death on the cross. But it means nothing if he stays dead. Because if, if, if Jesus uh, does not rise from the dead, then what was Burke Braderach's song? What's it all about, Alfie? <laughs> is it just for the moment that we live? If, if, if there is no resurrection, that means that uh, life is temporal. If there is no uh, resurrection, that simply means that this is it. Once we die, it's over. You're like Rover. You're dead all over. <laughs> So notice, the very message of Jesus was what? Was what? Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So the resurrection, the resurrection not only does it confirm the fact that Jesus is indeed God, uh, Emmanuel, God uh, with us, that he's Jesus, Jehovah, he is salvation, but the resurrection says, yes, he is indeed God in the flesh. All the biblical claims about him are false if Jesus doesn't get up from the grave. All of the Old Testament uh, prophecies uh, are unreliable if he doesn't get up from the grave. The Bible says that Jonah, being in the fish for three days, was simply a, 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 a glimpse. It was a glimpse of what is going to happen to Jesus. And he even said, just as Jonah was in the heart, uh, uh, in the belly of the fish, so the Son of Man will be three days in the heart of the earth. Fulfilling that Old Testament prophecy, he, Jesus, began to talk about uh, the day of Sodom and Gomorrah. He began to talk about uh, the day of Noah and the flood. And he began to re refer back to all those uh, Incidents that we see recorded in the Old Testament. And he, if he did not rise from the dead, that simply means not only is he false, not only is he a liar, not only is he a blasphemer, but all that stuff we read about in the Old Testament, it cannot be reliable either. Because Jesus said that those Old Testament scriptures spoke of him. So I'm glad that the tomb is still empty. See, the resurrection completes God's redemptive work through Christ. You see, the resurrection, folks, the resurrection addresses the issues that are central to the gospel. What makes the good news good news? The resurrection. What makes the good news uh, something that we sing about, shout about? Uh, notice he says, I, be, I deliver to you what? The gospel uh, that was preached to you, that you received the same gospel that saved you. you. You're standing on it. You're saved by it. What is it that makes the gospel such good news? Yes, the fact that he died for our sins is good news. But now the Bible says he serves as our advocate. See, if he does not go and, 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 and resume his place in glory, then when he said that I am the way, the truth, and the life, no man comes to the Father but by me, that means nothing if he's still in dust, if he's still in the grave. He says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if he does not raise from the dead, that means you don't have a place in heaven. If he does not raise from the grave, why are we here? This becomes nothing more than a social club. So therefore, the Apostle Paul takes great pains to help us to appreciate the significance of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because if Christ has not raised, we're all men must most to be what? Pitied. The resurrection chapter addresses issues central to the gospel and to the whole book of Romans. If a person does not believe in the resurrection, he must deny in a lump the gospel and everything 
that is proclaimed about Christ. If there's no resurrection, this means nothing. If there's no resurrection, that just that salvation is counterfeit. If there's no resurrection, then we're just going through the motions. So therefore today, the Apostle Paul helps us to understand not only the implications of the resurrection, but also the importance of the resurrection of Christ. The importance. You see, um, the whole Christian faith would not exist because there's something that has to fuel. See, it's the resurrection. It's the resurrection that, that stands as the operating power, the operating power for the believer. It's kind of like you have a, a, a brand new car, and it's a beautiful car, but you don't put no gas in it. There needs, to have some, there needs to be some operating power. See, the Holy Spirit is that operating power in your walk. Right. It's the Spirit of God in you that gives you the power to fight the good fight of faith. Right. But you see, if there's no resurrection, guess what? There's no Holy Spirit. Because Jesus said, I go uh, to prepare a place for you. But I'm going to send. I'm going to send. See, Jesus is the comforter. He's the comforter. But he says, I'm going to send another comforter. Speaking of the Holy Spirit. Uh, but you won't receive this comforter. You won't receive this power until I go back to my Father, and then I will send him to you. So therefore, if there's no resurrection, there's no Holy Spirit. Are you following? Notice what the Bible says. Turn with me quickly. I, I want you to see this. See, because we all must encounter our physical death. If we are here as we tarry for the Lord's return, if he has not returned by the time when you expire, what happens to you? Notice what the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians, the fourth chapter. Starting in, starting in verse number, because anybody drink out of here? Starting start in verse 13. The Apostle Paul says, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not. Now, when, see, when, we, when, when a person dies, we sorrow. Yes, we do. Yes, we say it's, you know, it's home going and you know, it's, not, you know, it's a celebration. All. I get that. I get that. But we still sorrow. But notice what the text said. The text don't say, does not say that we don't sorrow, does it? Yes, we do. However, for the believer, it says uh, that we sorrow not even as others which have no hope. We have, if I lose a loved one, yes, it's going to be a sorrowful occasion. But if they're in the Lord, I don't sorrow as one who has no hope. Amen. See, the resurrection of Jesus Christ gives hope. The fact that uh, he shed his mortality and took on immortality gives me hope as I still tarry in this mortal body. That I have hope that one day I'm going to have a new body. A body, and don't ask me how to describe that new body. I don't know. The only thing I know will be like him. Amen. And that's good enough. Amen. That's good enough for me. He says, uh, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them which uh, also which sleep in... Notice the preposition, in Jesus. You know, if you're not in Jesus and you fall asleep, you have an expectation, but it's not a hopeful expectation. For those who die in Jesus, the Bible says, I don't want to gloss over that preposition, in 
Jesus, not close to around Jesus. You know, you know, uh, you know, my great great so and so and so was a preacher and all that kind of stuff. I mean, I praise God for that. But your relationship to God through Jesus has to be for yourself. You can't inherit. You can't inherit your mama and daddy's faith. You've got to make sure that you have a vital connection with Christ on your own, for yourself. And for those who die and are asleep in Jesus, will God bring with them with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. I like that, by the word of the Lord that we which are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven. See, if the Lord is not raised, uh, there will be no trumpet sound. If the Lord is not raised, those who died uh, in Christ died in vain. If there, there, if there be no resurrection, we won't have that day. When the Bible says that, that, that the voice of the archangel will sound like a shout, and the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, and the Lord will come uh, in his splendor, in his glory, and in his majesty to receive us. Oh, what a glorious day. If there's a resurrection. And so, therefore, the Bible tells us that we comfort we comfort one another with these words. What words? The fact that those who die in the Lord do not die in vain. Because Jesus rose from the dead. The Bible says even in this text in uh, the 15th chapter of, uh, of the book of 1 Corinthians that not only uh, was he rose, did, he, uh, did he rise again on the third day, but then it begins to talk about those witnesses. Those witnesses. I can remember the Bible said early in the morning on the first day of the week that Mary Magdalene, Mary Magdalene came to finish her unfinished business. You see, they were preempted and they were cut short in, in their preparing the body uh, for the proper Jewish burial. And so therefore she came with her spices to, to finish the process came and found that the stone was rolled away. And I often thought that the angels came and, and rolled the stone away so Jesus would come out of The stone was rolled away for us. Jesus was not bound by the stone. Jesus could come right through the stone. Jesus rolled. Did you see the linen clothes over there? Did you see the linen, how he was wrapped in those clothes? Uh, that when they observed the clothes, they were in a cocoon kind of shape. In a cocoon, he, like he just, he, he just raised up out of, just transformed uh, through, and it was still because those clothes were wrapped in those, those aloes and those myrrhs, and when that stuff hardens, it becomes like, it like a, you know, it, it becomes like, it, it becomes hard, like a cast in a way. And it was still there in this cocoon shape. But Jesus wasn't in there. Amen. See, the stone was rolled away for you and for me. We had to see it. The Bible says that Peter and John came and looked in. They looked in. <laughs> John got there. He, he got there before Peter did. He wouldn't even look. He was going for that. He peeped. In. <laughs> he peeped in there. He ain't there. <laughs> Peter, being a little bit more brave, he walked in and he... He saw me look around and he didn't see. I think I preached that before. I saw the, the three words for see. One, he saw, made a casual observation. The other one looked in, and, 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 and made a more astute observation and drew some conclusions. And then the other one looked in and he perceived. <laughs> he saw something. That, he saw something, not with his physical eye, but with his heart. He saw that Jesus had rose from the dead. Don't have the time to talk about when he had an encounter with that woman, Mary, and she mistaked him for from the gardener. He could have been the gardener because the Bible says he's a rose of Sharon. The Bible says he's a lily of the valley. He could have been the gardener. But I thank God today that he was not the gardener. Oh no. He was, he was Christ the Lord. 
Notice, and I have to make sure I get some of this in. Um, so, the believer, the believer's hope, the foundation, the anchor of the Christian faith, the believer's hope, uh, the, the, the man of God's walk in the path of righteousness, all hinges on, and the, the, the very premise a foundation of our spiritual walk is predicated on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. And so we celebrate the resurrection today. Why? Because it is the resurrection that gives us life. It gives us power. It gives us hope. It gives us the consistency in our walk. See, the Bible says we have a present help in Jesus. Amen. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, if he did not uh, 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 a sin to be seated uh, uh, in his rightful position in the Godhood or the Godhead, then he cannot be our hope. He cannot see it's a bodily resurrection of Jesus that gives all of us a hope for our bodily resurrection. You know, if Jesus uh, did not raise from the dead, then the Bible says that our preaching is in vain. Your faith is in vain. The apostles told a big lie. It was all a hoax. Jesus was some uh, person who was out of his mind. He was a blasphemer. And we are still in our sins. And those who dare to live a Christian life ought to be most pitied. That's the importance of the resurrection. It's only the real the real reality of the resurrection of Christ as a guarantee of our own future resurrection that can induce a power, uh, a, 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 a motive that is sufficient to accept the conditions that we face in terms of opposition as we strive to fight the good fight of faith. What begins to be the glue that holds us together when everyone else is falling apart. What is it? What is it that helps us to keep on holding on? The fact that Jesus is alive and well and therefore his hand is stretched out for us and we have something to hold on to. What is it? Ah, as we look at the impact of the resurrection. You see, the resurrection completely changed those ordinary a Galileans, you see those apostles who came out of the ghetto of Galilee. They did come, not come from the large cities or the great universities, some hick town, country town of Galilee. That's why on the day of Pentecost when the Bible says that they were endued with power and began to speak with other tongues, the Bible says there were some who began to mock, saying, oh, oh these, must, these folks must be drunk. And the Bible says that even that, uh, that impact, I don't want to get too much into this, but <laughs> I got to talk about the Pentecost phenomena just a little bit. Right. It's something called the Pentecost phenomena. You see, <laughs> I didn't mean to go into all this. But you see, the resurrection completely changed those ordinary Galileans into the most powerful witnesses the world had ever seen. Amen. This was a result of the Pentecost phenomena. Again, as I refer back to Acts chapter 1, where he says, uh, For you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and uh, uh, in Samaria and even to the uttermost parts of the earth. When will we be witnesses? When? This power comes on you. What power, Jesus, are you talking about? Uh, the Holy Spirit power that you're going to receive. I have to go. And when I go away, I'm going to send uh, this comforter. This comforter is an interesting kind of idea because it's this comforter that I'm promising you is going to be experienced on the day of Pentecost. On the day of Pentecost, in the second chapter of the book of Acts, we see that those, those disciples were still. Oh, you know when, 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 when Jesus died and uh, all the disciples were scattered, right? 
and uh, they were cowering. They were, they were scared. They next. You know, you, they were, their face was on every morning post in town. Newsflash. Have you seen these men? And they were hiding, cowering behind closed doors. The Bible says that Mary came and said, he's risen. And they did not believe her. They began to rebuke her. And they behind closed doors, bolted, shut tight. And all of a sudden, Jesus coming through the door. He comes right on, he comes right in their midst. And the first thing that he did, it was not to give the great commission. The first thing that he did was to rebuke them for their unbelief. Come over here. Handle me. Observe uh, the nail prints uh, in my body. The spear uh, that pierced my side. Hand to me. Get a full understanding. Now you now see and believe it. But blessed are those who believe who have not seen. And I'm going to give you some power. Because I know you still are in your humanness. You need some divine revelation. You need some divine spiritual power that can come and tell I leave. I've got to go back to my father. And when I go back to my father, I'm going to sin. Another comforter. And notice this Pentecost phenomenon says on the, on, on the day of Pentecost. In other words, 50 days after uh, the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, this, 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 so the tabula, the festival of weeks. I don't have to get into all that. Well, that Leviticus 20, 23 talks about that Pentecost. But anyway, <laughs> I got to get out of this. The Bible says that that power that came on the day of Pentecost uh, was so observable. They, the Bible says that they were, they were tarrying. They were in the upper room waiting and just waiting. And the Bible says there came a sound from heaven as of a mighty and rushing wind. Notice there was no leaves blowing. They said a sound. Hello? We get that picture, whoo, all the wind and trees are swaying and all. No, it says a sound from heaven, like a mighty rushing wind. And then there appeared unto them cloven tongues of the fire, and, and it began to separate and light ascend on each one of them. And they began to speak in different languages, as the Holy Spirit gave them others. There were men from Pontus and, 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 and Cappadocia and all that. I don't have time to read all that, but you can go Acts chapter 2 and read it for yourself. But the bottom line is, uh, from all these different nations, people begin to hear the word of God being proclaimed in their own tongue, Amen. in their own language. And they begin to say, these men must be drunk. And then, 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 <laughs> and then Peter, Peter stood up and said, we're not drunk as you suppose. It's only 9 o'clock in the morning. And then he began to say, but this is that. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. That in the last day, see the Holy Spirit, uh, this ho the Holy Spirit phenomenon, the Pentecost phenomenon marked the last day uh, episode being ushered in to time. And the Bible says uh, this promise uh, that had been uh, made by Jesus concerning the Holy Spirit. It was designed to, number one, perfect their recollection. It's to, to, it going to bring to remembrance. You know the story in John chapter 14. In John chapter, he, I'm going to send another comforter. He's going to bring to your remembrance all the things that I have taught you. Perfect recollection. And then not only that, and teach them all things pertaining to the gospel message, and then also to guide them, to guide them into all truth. None of that would have, take place, would have taken place if the Holy Spirit phenomenon, as we see on the day of Pentecost, would not have occurred. And that phenomenon would not have occurred had Jesus not gotten up from the grave. So the whole Pentecost phenomenon itself is evidence uh, of the Holy Spirit, that same Holy Spirit, uh, the person of the Holy Spirit that Jesus would send when he rose from the dead and ascended back to his Father. But the fact that we have the Pentecost phenomena is evidence of the authenticity of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. The precondition for the Holy Spirit's coming was Jesus going back to the Father. Amen. These men who changed the world 
had to first be changed themselves. That change took place on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came upon them. The Holy Spirit was sent by Jesus. Notice, as I hasten to close, we've looked at three things, the implications, the importance, and also the impact of the resurrection. But I want to leave you with this question. And that is, what is the individual's response to the resurrection of Jesus Christ? In other words, what is your response? Did Jesus die in vain? No, he did not. But the deeper question today is, will you live in vain? A life without Christ. A life without the power of God in your life is a life with no meaning, a life that is impotent, a life that is wandering around in circles. You're living, waiting to be buried. You see, the question moves from did Jesus die in vain to will you live in vain? You see, in Jesus you have a redeemer. Who was that with a Job? Says, I know. I know that my redeemer lives. I know he lives. Do you know that you have a redeemer? Some of you under the sound of my voice today may not even be a member of the body of Christ. I don't know who you are, but God does. You know where you are. I'm not here to throw a stone, but like Jeremiah's hammer, when it comes down, if your feet in the way, <laughs> you have a redeemer, church. Everyone under the sound of my voice, there is a redeemer Amen. who is saying, I extend to you the great invitation. And this invitation is for all you who are weary and heavy laden. The promise is that I will give you rest. The invitation for discipleship is to not only bask in in the sun of your salvation, but discipleship says uh, you have to move toward sanctification. That's why he says, not only am I going to give you this rest in Jesus Christ, but he says, now take my yoke upon you. And learn as discipleship, folks, as now I'm becoming a, a disciple of Christ. I'm going to now walk. Uh, I'm yoked up with Christ. So I'm going to go where he wants me to go. I'm going to do what he wants me to do. I'm going to say what he wants me to say. I'm going to live the way he wants me to live. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light and you shall find rest. The first rest was a rest of God's grace, the rest of salvation. But now, now that you're in there, you take that yoke up on you. Walk with him. Learn of him. Be moved in the direction that he wants you to go. And then you will find rest. You will find the wherewithal to live a holy and set apart and powerful life in this now time side of life. Right. You need some resurrection power right now. Amen. Did Jesus die in vain? Ah, the question is, will you live in vain? To live in vain means that you may even have a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. There's so many folk who espouse Christ, who profess Christ, but we live as like he's a complete and total stranger. You have an advocate. We have an advocate with the Father. But you see, if Jesus is still dead in the grave, there's no one to plead your case before the Father. You know that? If Jesus has not risen, if he's not, uh, did he not rise to live forevermore, then there's no one there to be an advocate for you. You need an advocate. You need somebody to intercede for you. You need somebody to be able to take your petitions to God. You need Jesus. Why? Because he said, I'll also be your savior. I'll be your savior. I came and I died. Uh, I was buried and I rose again on the third day. I did all that for you. Now, I'm not asking you at this time what you're going to do for me. I'm asking, what are you going to do for you? The implications of that question will determine your, where you spend eternity. What are you going to do for you? 
You've heard the proposition. The Apostle Paul says, I, print, I presented to you the gospel, the very gospel that I preached, that you, uh, you heard it, you received it, uh, you're standing on it, you're saved by it, that Jesus died for our sins, folks, according to the scripture, and that he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day. He is the triumphant Christ. He is the victorious Christ. The resurrection says that uh, we can live a life uh, that has meaning as well as purpose. The resurrection says that I uh, have a hopeful expectation that uh, this old body uh, that you see in front of you right now, I, can, I was looking back at some pictures of, uh, a while ago and I saw some pictures of me when I was a little bitty old fella. I'm not a little old fella now. You know, I... I uh, Shaving this morning, I said, ooh, I got to shave all these gray hairs in my head. <laughs> in other words, we all have to face our own mortality. Amen. But you don't have to face it by yourself. Because Jesus said, I'm, I, I'm, I got your back. <laughs> Jesus said, I'll be with you always, even until the end of the age. We have a Savior who's able to do what we cannot do. Amen. He paid a price that we could not pay. Because we owed a debt. I don't want to get into this too much, but the Bible says that we need to understand that we all have an opportunity to come to Jesus. We have an opportunity to come to Jesus right now today. I mean, if you really uh, love the Lord, like you say, you love the Lord, you ought to understand that Jesus died, he was buried, he rose again the third day. And notice he called the resurrection in this text, he called it the gospel. He says the gospel, the good news of Jesus. And then he began to elaborate and, and point out the significance of the resurrection. There's no gospel without the resurrection. Amen. See, you can't live an empowered life without the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. Last time I checked, is the tomb still empty over there? The last time I checked, it was still empty. And as long as the tomb is empty, we can live. Now, here's the, here's the thing that gets many of us choked up and tripped up. The gospel, the Bible says we're saved by grace. But it doesn't stop there. Ephesians 2 and 8. For by grace you are saved. Through faith. What is the faith? See, see, see grace. See, salvation, let me just say this in, in closing. Salvation has two sides. The divine side of salvation is the grace of God. The grace of God is what? It's God's initiative. God does that work. God is the one who uh, has orchestrated your redemption. You can't earn it. You can't deserve it. You can't. It's an unmerited favor. God's grace. That's the divine side of your salvation. But there's also a human side. He says you're saved by grace through faith. Faith is how you appropriate the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ Amen. to your life. Amen. How do you participate or benefit from his death? I present to you the practical side of the gospel. The death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The Bible says... For God be thanked that you have obeyed from the heart that form of teaching. The word form is not the word that we see in Philippians 2, although he existed in the form of God. The word morphe, we get the word metamorphosis, form. The word form is morphe. But there's another word that's used in Romans chapter 6 and verse 17. It's the word tupos. Simply means the pattern. You have obeyed from the heart that pattern of teaching, that form of doctrine, that pattern of teaching. What is the, what is the, what is the teaching? The death, burying and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The Bible says, for, so, so, so we can, can continue in sin that grace may abound? He said, God forbid. He said, know ye not that as many of you that were what? Baptized into Christ were baptized into the benefits 
<laughs> of his death. Just as Christ died and was buried and rose again the third day, so we also shall walk in the newness of life. So if you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and you're willing to repent of your sins, confess him as Lord, and be willing to be buried in the watery grave of baptism for the forgiveness or the remission of your sins that puts you into fellowship with God. It's all by faith. That's simply your response to what God has done. How will you respond? Think about that and make the appropriate response. As together we stand and sing a song of encouragement.